So should we kick things off here? Yeah, yeah, we can kick things off right now. Uh, I just started the recording, so you guys should see the recording in the top left. Awesome, let me make a note, getting things started. Glad you got that out of the way. You know, it's like uh, we've been doing these webinars for so long, and every every time somebody's like, is this webinar going to be recorded? <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's actually the first note I have right here is this webinar is recorded. So thank you everyone for being here. We'll be happy to share this with you afterwards. So when we get it all edited and it looks good so that all of the, I don't know, weird transitions are edited out, you'll have this. Uh, so you can come back to it at any time. So we'd really appreciate it if you liked it. Uh, tell us if you liked it and share it with your friends, your peer groups, or anyone who might think this is super valuable. Uh, also, we encourage participation the entire time. I've done a lot of webinars for small business development centers for like cybersecurity focused stuff. The uh, most effective, the, like the most useful part of it is always when you have a very specific question about uh, your business or maybe your client's business that you would like to ask. These two people right here, Wes and Jimmy, are the people to ask those questions to. So please put them in the chat. We'll definitely get to them and make sure uh, somebody will make sure we end up seeing them. So that's that. But let me introduce our speakers so that you know who Jimmy and Wes are. Uh, so Jimmy is the former director of marketing at Scout Cybersecurity and Barracuda. He is currently the director of marketing at QuickPass. And I have I know this first firsthand. He is a cigar aficionado, oh, even God. though he's probably cringing now that I'm saying that. Um, Wes Spencer is a really good friend of mine. He's also a cybersecurity expert for many, many years. Uh, and he is the former co-founder of Perch Security. So these are the two people that we're chatting with. And I am Connor, the CEO and co-founder of Finn. Uh, and I have been working with, uh, you know, MSPs for over two years now, building their cybersecurity programs and creating things uh, for them. So the topic today, security workforce do's and don'ts, understanding CIS Control 14. So for those that, those of you that don't know, CIS Control 14 is the security awareness and skills training control. So it deals with securing your workforce and making sure they know what to do. And very importantly, knowing what not to do. Uh, an exact quote actually that I pulled from this, uh, from CIS's website is, the actions of people play a critical part in the success or failure of an enterprise's security program. It is easier for an attacker to entice a user to open a link click an email, do something than it is to install malware in order to get into an enterprise. So people are not only super important, but could also be a potential risk that we should all be aware of. And that's kind of what we're discussing today. So I've talked enough, but so Wes, what is CIS? Yeah. Uh, thank first. Thanks for having us. And yeah. two, you guys, if you have questions, thoughts, anything, just pop them into chat, put everyone in there. So we'll all see it. Um, but let's make it a discussion by all means. We're definitely not here to just speak only. So um, jump in as much as you want. So CIS is awesome, right? They are a nonprofit. And I know a bunch of people at CIS. I've been working with them for um, a couple of years now. They do all sorts of things around forwarding and, and progressing cybersecurity at home here in the U.S., but, but also a focus abroad as well to some degree. Um, I'll give you some examples of what they do, uh, Connor. One thing that they do is harden images. So they actually create like baseline standards of like, here's what a Windows, a hardened Windows server looks like. Maybe it's a database. So here's some things you want to make sure that you have fully configured, which is a godsend, right? Because that stuff is very difficult to do. Um, some other things that they do is they do a lot of like benchmarking kind of stuff in cybersecurity to really let us understand where they're at. Um, they actually support a number of ISACs, ISACs, that's Information Security and Analysis Centers. These are like nonprofit threat sharing groups. And I, I was actually a member of one and, and had a directorship position at the bank that I was at before in the financial services ISAC. And so they support a couple of them, like the electricity ISAC, I think the elections ISAC, and then the multi-state ISAC, which is like government groups. So basically they, they, they facilitate the ability for them to share threats that they're seeing between peers and, and also have a conduit to the federal government. But then I think notably, Connor, for what we're talking about today, CIS also publishes 
what's called the like the top 18 controls, the CIS controls. There's 18 of them. And what's so good about them is it's a very prescriptive process, right? So like it tells you do this, do this, do this, do this. And what's so great about that is MSPs can grab that and you have a starting point. You have a process to get going in all of this instead of feeling like, well, where do I start and what do I do first? They're like, no, 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 no. We're going we're gonna to boil this down to 18 controls. And if you go through this journey of maturing your organization through these 18 controls, you will measurably demonstrably increase your cybersecurity posture. And the other thing I'll say as well, Connor, is they, they split it into three groups, implementation group one, two, and three. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, but you start with group one, and then maybe you can progress eventually to, to group two. Group three is probably not as important for most MSPs, um, but it's it's a start, it's a guide point for us to like to begin to to build and mature our security process. And what's so great about it is it's done by a nonprofit, so they don't really have a, an like an agenda in mind. They're not trying to sell you something, which is which is so great about it as well. Just trying to create better security in all all different types of companies. So. Jimmy, Wes did a great job explaining CIS. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, just just uh, like from the big picture, a lot of the time we talk about regulations and frameworks and standards. Um, so generally, most regulations are derived from a couple of frameworks, and that's NIST, which I'm sure you've heard that term tossed around a bunch, ISO for cybersecurity 27001, uh, and CIS, the top 18 CIS controls. Many of the things and recommendations are going to overlap across uh, these different frameworks. So it, it, people will ask me, oh, do you comply with this? Do you comply with that? Do you comply with that? And um, they're asking, you know, if you comply with a certain framework or certain standard, if you can um, align your business to these 18 controls or to NIST or ISO or whichever one you pick, um, you're going to be most of the way there for almost every standard uh, and regulation. So um, I think NIS or CIS, which we're talking about today, is great. As Wes said, it's a great place to start um, and it's very prescriptive. So I'm not going to cover any more about the organization because I learned most of that today from Wes. So thank you for that <laughs> education there. Yeah, I think you, you brought up something really important too, Jimmy. When I when I was first researching security awareness programs and what do all these various compliance frameworks say about security awareness, I realized that there are almost all of them say the exact same thing. And then maybe there's a few, they sp some of them sprinkle in a little bit more than others. Uh, but starting in a place almost certainly means a lot of it'll transfer to anything else that you would need to transfer into. If you were, if you had a client that needed more security or needed to can't think of many of the hundreds of examples that this could happen with, but needed to be compliant with a different framework for some reason that it wouldn't be hard to transfer that. It's, so it's I'm awesome. curious, Connor, if we could pop up a couple of poll questions. I want to hear back from you sure. guys in the audience um, and, and really kind of measure where you're at in the CIS journey if you're even using it. It's okay if you're not, right? So we've got two questions I wanted to ask. One is, if you're using CIS, so don't answer this if you're not, but if you're involved in it in some, some form or fashion, right? Are you fully mapped to implementation group one? That's the introductory implementation group. That's like the standard level starting process that all MSPs can get through. It might take you a year to get through it fully if you commit, but you can get through it and it is accomplishable. So I want to know that. Um, are you fully mapped for your own MSP? Yes or no? And then the second question we want to know is, what about your clients? Are you taking your clients down this journey as well? If you are, what percentage of your clients are fully mapped to IG1? So like none, somewhere around a quarter, you see the data there. Give us some feedback. We'll leave that open for a few more seconds. And then um, I want to look at that data because that'll really help us measure like where you're at in your own journey and um, give us some insights as we go through talking about Control 14 yeah. as well. It is anonymous too. So I do not know who is responding no or yes, if there are any weird uh, issues with you feeling embarrassed for any reason. I do not know who's saying yes or no. We just get the general results here. Got so. it. And David saying in chat that he's not a uh, MSP. So David, if you would answer question one, but you can omit question two, since you don't have clients that you're, you're pulling them through this journey on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wes, can you explain, you might've touched on this briefly already. Um, so we're going through CIS control 14. There's nine specific sub points and all of them are IG one, except for the last one. So what is IG one? Uh, it may be a little bit more in depth and when should it apply to people or what should they aspire to end up getting to? Yeah. So, so IG one is, is 
This is CIS's way of saying, okay, we have 18 encompassing controls for you to go through, but we recognize that under each one, we might have 10, 15 sub controls in some cases. And so that's a lot of things to go through. And what they wanna do is they wanna prioritize uh, bang for the buck, right? Like how many birds can we kill with one stone here? And so what they didn't wanna do is force you down this journey where like some pieces of a control might be really hard to do. Maybe it's expensive, maybe it's time consuming, maybe it's very process heavy. And they're like, look, this is valuable, but we would rather you do these other things first. And so IG1 is the, uh, the, like the most important things to start with. And they have some statistics. And I'm going to make this up off the top of my head because I'm not going to Google search it live with you. But okay. um, they, they talk about um, there's somewhere between like 70 to 80 percent of all of like the miter attack tactics. And I know I'm introducing a new thing too, but miter attack, miter is yet another nonprofit. And they spend time sort of like analyzing how to threats happen and where where do they happen and so when you combine the cis controls with miter attack they realized wow a whole bunch of these kinds of attacks can actually be addressed and managed and mitigated by following cis ig1 by going down the beginner route and that's exciting right and so right. that's what ig1 is and then as you get through that then you can pick up ig2 and you can pick up ig3 and the goal is not to be like I'm certified IG3. There's no such thing. What it's about is just going through and saying, what's good for my organization? I'm just going to tell you, IG1 is good for all organizations. But then when you get into IG2, it's okay for you to be like, we're going to do these ones, but I'm going to skip that one. That's okay, right? Like that's totally fine. And you document why you're skipping it and move on. And then same with IG3. That's just, it's, it's, a, it's a journey of maturity. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So Jimmy, there are nine sub points. The first one is establish and maintain a security awareness program. We can get into defining what that means in a bit. But the question I have specifically, how do you go above and beyond compliance, which is, you know, all of us have seen the security awareness programs that are there to be compliant with cyber insurance or a framework or a, an audit of sorts. How do we go above and beyond that into actually being effective and reducing the risk that your workforce is insecure? Sure. I mean, I think the first thing is just acknowledging that compliance does not mean security. Uh, compliance is great because it is a CYA and it gives you something to point to and said, we complied with this. Uh, it gives you some legal protection as well. I'm not a lawyer though, so you'll have to talk to your lawyer to get specifically what that is. Uh, but then you need actual effectiveness in good security, especially if you're running an MSP a security incident, it's going to cost you business, it's going to cost you downtime, it's going to be reputation, tons and tons of things. Um, so just finding something that complies can be very mundane, very boring, uh, and it's not going to actually make you more secure, especially if people are skipping through things. I mean, we've all been through like security awareness training before. Um, so when you're creating these programs, if it's something that is boring and there's no buy-in from your end user, there's no reason to actually do it, you're, you're, you're not going to get much better security. You're just going to yeah. get a checkbox somewhere. So specifically for MSPs, uh, this is what I see after working with almost a hundred of them at this point. Um, there's three parts to a security awareness program. There's the assessments, right? Those can come in many forms, quizzes, phishing simulations, whatever it ends up being. Then there's the training, but then there is also buy-in. And everyone that I have talked to glosses over that buy-in part because, you know, as security folk, we see the importance of security awareness and programs and making sure we have effective cybersecurity. And we kind of forget, it's like, oh, there are people who this isn't their job. This isn't what they're excited about. They just want to go to work, do a really good job and work for a great company. And so they gloss over. It's like, of course, everyone should be bought in, right? That's the right thing to do. Uh, it's the, probably the, I don't want to call it a mistake, but oversight that I see that's really missing from effective programs is buy-in from the leadership and more importantly, the people that need to act secure, the employees themselves. Um, Wes, I just did share those poll results. Can you see them? Yeah. So I've got them back. I think most, I think everyone on the, in the audience should see them too. So this is really good feedback, right? Most of us, only, only one has gone through IG1 completely. The rest have not, and none have brought their clients through it. Um, there's nothing to be like ashamed of that just helped us measure the temperature. So we're so glad you're on this call today because we did want to demystify a little bit about what CIS is. And so that's important given that many of you are introduced probably maybe one of the first times today. And then secondly, 
kind of talking through how you go down this journey of bringing your clients. That's the second part. But first we eat our own tacos as my, as my Texans say. So we're going to eat our own tacos by, by doing this on our own as an MSP, or for those of you that are not an MSP, your own organization. And then we'll think about others next, right? We, we can't throw the life jacket out until we ourselves are safe. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think I, I think I know exactly who you stole that quote from because there's only one other person in this world I've heard say eat my own tacos and then sends me regular videos of him eating tacos so yes um that's so that's 14.1 14.2 I just put in the chat train workforces to members to recognize social engineering um Wes it'd be interesting to hear your opinion yeah. okay this, social engineering this, sorry it's this one go ahead oh yeah I was gonna say this one is so important right because Here's what I want. So I've built a, a, a in, like a security awareness program at my bank. I've done this before. So, so I've, I've got the battle scars to prove it, right? And where I think we go wrong a lot of times is that we're like, oh, well, I just bought Finn security. Finn is awesome. So I've got a security awareness training. Psh, done. Check the box. Move on. And then you realize, wait a second. This is not as effective as I wanted it to be. Why did I have this security incident that got, that was a pretty big issue for us? Because I had Finn in place. Like, why, why did it not, why did it not work? Well, Finn is like what you guys are doing, Connor, is critical. Like, you can't have a security awareness program without Finn in place or or something, someone like it, right? But what it comes down to is, and this is what Jimmy mentioned earlier, is the buy-in piece is so critical here because the buy-in piece is what teaches, gets us the, the end result, which is ultimately the end user who's not a security person saying, wait a second, that thing doesn't look right. I'm going to let someone know about it. That's how you know it's actually becoming successful. And there are so many incidents that occur in, in cybersecurity. And I know this from my days at Perch and Jimmy from Scout as well. We have seen the vast majority of like these big security events that end up in business email compromise and like hundreds of thousands of dollars have been wired out or ransomware. They occur oftentimes because a user clicked on something. A user opened an email that they didn't realize was fraudulent. They, they fed their credentials into like they thought was Microsoft. And so the goal of a security awareness program is not just to put the tools in place, to put the knowledge in place, but also to teach our, our folks to say, to raise the alarm and say, well, that doesn't look right. And there are mechanics that go in place to make sure we're good at that. Like one of those mechanics is we, and I would tell this to my staff all the time at the bank. I would say, we will never, ever, 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 ever get mad at a user for reporting something that was a false alarm. And then I would go and tell all our people at the bank, I'm like, my IT people will never berate you. I would rather you send us on wild goose chase after wild goose chase instead of you being like, well, I don't want to share it with them because they're going to get mad. So I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to do it. That's super bad. That's way worse. And so right. setting that culture to where your, your, your people feel incentivized. And then I even had the ability to get gift cards, like real gift cards, not like scammer ones. Uh, yeah. And I would give <laughs> them out and I would make it known, hey, I gave a $20 gift card out to Sarah Sue at this branch over here because she reported XYZ and this was awesome for us. And here's why it was cool. And I would even do a couple like email snippets of like, here's what the attack was yeah. trying to do. And people would like, reach out to me and be like, that's, whoa, I had no idea. We're raising the bar of awareness and encouraging people to, to report it. This is the goal for what we're trying to do here, Connor. Yeah. And I guarantee a $20 gift card is way, way less money than any successful social engineering attack and what it could have turned into. Wes, when, would you buy the gift cards or would you text your new assistant from a random number? Uh, yeah, I would definitely <laughs> just text them. Yeah. 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 It's, <laughs> this if is, you guys don't know what Jimmy's joking about. You, 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 we're, you're seeing all these gift card scams all the time that come in over email or text. I need you to buy these gift cards for me. <laughs> I was actually, I was surprised to see, uh, I was scrolling through LinkedIn one time and there was a CVS with a sign in front of their gift cards that said, if you're like handwritten too. So it was like, how many people had to come into the store every day for it to happen? It said, if your CEO asked you to buy these gift cards, call them because they did not do this. And I thought that was really interesting because everyone has that store. I thought it was like a rarity. And then I talked with a bunch of different businesses. I'm like, oh yeah, that happened last week and the week before that and the month before that. I'm like, how many times are you guys going to fall for this before we it's start a real problem? Helping people. Yeah, I, I want to call that out too because I, I was thinking about it when Wes was talking this is an opportunity where you can actually like have that, that 
uh, light bulb moment with your with your end users or with new customers if you're an MSP. Every single person, when you go to talk to them, you say, do you have a problem with cybersecurity? You start talking about cyber. Oh, we don't have any problems. We're not a target. I hear it over and over and over and over again. And then you start asking other questions like, oh, have you ever had a bank wire thing or a gift card thing? And every single person has a story on it, or yeah. ransomware or something. So, you know, th this is a moment where you can get that, like, this is real for me and I might need to take this a little seriously, Yeah, which is very important. The, the saddest part about all that too is the individual loses out, right? The business is not culpable. The insurance is not going to pay for that because the individual fell for it. And then all that money's gone four or 500 bucks could mean a lot to them. Um, so, yeah. So 14.3, let's make sure we end up hitting a lot of these points, specifically you, Jimmy. So 14.3 is training workforce members on authentication best practices. So immediately, we had straight to a conversation about multi-factor authentication, right? But what would you consider best authentication practices and why, if it's not MFA, I really, I'm, I'm in for a treat, but why MFA is my question. No, I mean, a MF ever, the, the hesitations around MFA are always ease of use and functionality. Um, and, you know, this, you, you get like the executive who doesn't want the app on their phone because it's annoying and they have to pull it up. But MFA, like business email compromise is the main threat vector um, for attacks on right. small businesses. Business email compromise uh, and open RDP ports and right. um, unpatched uh, systems is like the top three things. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very important and is the number one thing and should be preached everywhere. Insurance companies are requiring it now. It's, they, they did all this research, these insurance companies, and they're like, what can we require to make us pay less you know, uh, pay less out on payouts. And they're like, we can only do one thing. And they picked MFA. And that's because it stops a lot of threats. Um, I think too, if you want to make it more human, you can do things like, you know, here's uh, our new MFA thing. Also, if you want to enroll your Instagram account on MFA uh, and set that up, you know, something that they've seen other people get hacked on, here's some instructions on that too. Here's a, you know, little guide on that. Um, yeah. That's just, I, I mean, it's a no brainer. You have to have MFA. It is. It is. Absolutely. 14.4 um, training. This is, this is one that I've had a, a few experiences with training workforce on data handling best practices. Um, Wes, when we're talking with employees about handling data, what should we, what are the big areas that we should keep in mind? So a couple of things here is it's fair for this to be somewhat industry specific and you might do one set of guidelines for one kind of industry and a different for another example i keep using banks so banks have clean desk policies and they're extremely serious about these things like up to like if you violate them you're probably going to get written up and the reason why makes sense because banks are handling financial information and banks always have paper everywhere which is a shame but regulations force it and so you can't deal with having, you know, a banker who goes to lunch or ends their workday and right. just leaves their documents with financial information of their own folks sitting there on the table for like cleaning staff to see or someone walking by in the lobby, whatever it may be. It's non-negotiable. However, you flip that for like a totally different industry, you know, maybe like a restaurant or a chain of restaurants. Totally, totally understandable how that might be a little bit different. And so what we're trying to do here with this control is go through like what kind, the first question you ask is what kinds of data does our organization have and how much of it is it? And never discount the value of your data, right? Like it, there's definitely a lesson in this, right? Is like many people, many small businesses say things like, no one cares about my data. It's not worth anything. I'm like, are you sure about that? Let's kind of work through this. How does your organization make money? And you start learning like how they make their money and the kinds of data they receive. And maybe it's not social security numbers and credit cards, but it could be proprietary information. It could be, you know, order lists and it could be the vendors you have in place and who you do business with and your sales forecast. It could be important stuff. And so I think the goal here of 14.4 is to really understand, to, to go into that consultive role with your client, or if you're not an MSP with your own company and understand what kinds of data do we have, where does it flow? And then how do we protect it? So if it does get printed out a lot, let's make sure we have ways that we store that securely. Make sure that we have ways that we keep it off desks when we're not around. Let's put some of those things in place. And then, you know, maybe you're all electronic. Okay. 
Well, that's great. So now let's think through like, how do we make sure that we handle that in a, in a, in a way that, that maintains the data privacy in the, in the cloud environments, right? With encryption and who can access it and things like that. So this is really sort of becoming, I love this control because it's very consultive. You're really right. working with how do I put guardrails around where our data flows mm -hmm. to make sure that we protect it according to the kind of industry that we are. Absolutely. Um, now, this is Wes, Wes. Um, so I, I'm, I'm an IT guy, a nerdy guy, uh, as, as I think you are too. Now I could probably pull up just about any document I've ever handled in my personal life. Uh, college essay I wrote, uh, photo from whatever, 2007, um, in like two minutes. That is my culture. That is how I do it. Hoard data as much as possible, backups, copies, never let go of it. Now, is, should I bring that same culture to somewhere like a bank or something like that? Yeah. You know, that, that's a great, and it's funny you mentioned that you're reading my mind because right there is a laptop that I have. And I, ha I found an old hard drive that I'm getting some data off. And I kid you not, I found some old college stuff that I did way in the old days. So <laughs> like you literally read my mind on that one, Jimmy. Um, and what you're talking about is like data retention policies. And again, I hate to keep leaning on my banking days, right? I don't typically do that on a webinar, but I'm going to do it again. Because we had a situation in which we were storing some data for a client that went beyond the data retention period. So we were supposed to store it for seven years in this case, and we'd stored it for longer. And we got subpoenaed in a very nasty civil lawsuit between the client and one of his clients. And because we had the data, we had to produce it and we had to give it back. And we learned a great lesson that day of, you know what, when it goes beyond retention, it's out. Because if we didn't have that data and we weren't required by law to have it in retention, then there's of no trouble when we tell you know, the court under the subpoena, we have no data about this. It's beyond our retention policies. And so think about retention, like as much as Jimmy's right, like on the personal side, we want to hoard all of those things. And I understand it. It can be dangerous for an organization to hoard data longer than it needs to be hoarded, especially when a bad guy gets access to your network and has mountains and mountains and mountains of data that they never would have had had we deleted a lot of stuff out. So it is important to think through how do we even get rid of data after it goes past required retention periods. It's definitely something you need to think about. Yeah, I think you brought up a really good point earlier too. Is most people, uh, the mindset is, oh my, like my data is not valuable. I'm either a small business or in Jimmy's case, an individual. Who would want Jimmy's photos from 2007? Um, and I think the the thing that we need to sometimes communicate to clients is like it doesn't matter. Uh, how you would value your data, because there is always value in something that you're storing, almost certainly, that uh, typically the data is the lifeblood of your business, even if you wouldn't like to believe it. Somebody's probably willing to steal that. They might not go into your business trying to steal that, but they might end up coming out with it. Um, knowing which data you have is the first step to knowing which data you should not have, for sure. Uh, there was one question that I wanted to ask, risk appetite. And I think Jimmy brought this up. Uh, so when you're handling data, uh, there's always risks. So what should somebody think about when they're trying to, like Wes said, be in this consultative role, where they're trying to communicate the risk appetite that a client should have around certain types of data. And we could get into PCI, HIPAA, or any other kind of data that you might want to talk about here. I mean, we could get into a whole conversation about like data classification and all that, but I think Bottom line, when you start a discussion with any end user, you need to ask them, what is the critical information in your business? And you need to have this conversation because I, as an IT person, will often assume I know what the critical data is. And in most cases, I am wrong. And I did not believe that a long time ago until I started asking people. And you, you think it's HR data, you think it's, you know, whatever, um, uh, 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 client medical records or something like that. And it turns out that there is some like research division that is making the most money for that organization. And that's what they're really focused on protecting. So like, it's important to get that out of the way first, because, you know, you want to follow the controls and everything, but you also want to build extra layers of security around the information that they actually care about protecting. And that is going to cause their business the most harm and the most da damage. So um, you know, I guess my answer to my question, to your question is you need to make sure that you're asking and having an actual conversation about what data is actually critically important to their business. Have them talk to you about it. Everyone yeah, absolutely. To talk about themselves. 
I think another, uh, you know, sidestep to this equation is what vendors are, who are you working with that you're unintentionally giving access to the data that you're unaware of? So when we're working with MSPs, the first question we get is like, you're generating all of this data on my users. You, you have a connection to our Azure tenants. Like what data do you have? Who else am I, is my company talking to that we're potentially giving it access to? And where's that trail of auditability? Uh, that's a big question that we've, and I know Wes, I think I watched you do a webinar on this as well, or, or maybe it was a rant, if you'd like to classify it as a rant, of uh, making sure you're auditing your third parties. Uh, do you have anything you want to say on that before we move to the next? Yeah, I'll just be real quick on that so we can get to the next next one. But um, it is important to understand our third parties. Um, big, big things can happen from that. What happens when that third party has data on you or your clients and they have some kind of breach? What happens when that third party themselves get breached and because they have access into your data, you are now uh, involved in all of this. We've seen this happen over and over. If you look at what happened in July of last year, there was a company called Kaseya that had a huge breach. And because Kaseya had the ability to like install uh, programs and platforms for like for legitimate use cases, but a bad guy got a hold of that. Well, they could also use it to run ransomware everywhere, and and that's that's not an isolated incident. This happens all over the the place, right? And so, third party and supply chain risk is extremely important, and we're seeing regulations sort of form around all of this. We're seeing cyber insurance finally get smart <laughs> around all of this and understand. Yeah where where the fault lies and where the risk lies and who pays. This is called subrogation. We're seeing all of this really take off in, in really wild ways. And it must be addressed because um, it's becoming such a big deal in this age of interconnectedness. Yeah, absolutely. 14.5, uh, training workforce members to uh, not cause, or what are the causes for unintentional data exposure? A point I wanted to bring up here before we get into these questions is, your, why is a security awareness program important specifically when it comes to data? Well, it's because the employees that you have or that you're working with, that your clients have, they're the ones that are almost certainly generating this data. They have their fingers on the keyboard or they're talking with the clients uh, in the case of actually being in a medical office. They're the ones writing down all of this information, putting it into some centralized database. And so unintentional data exposure can occur not only from a cybersecurity incident happening, but an employee leaving their computer unlocked, as you talked about. I'm sure you have horror stories that uh, you might not be able to tell us actually about working at a bank and unintentional data exposure. Um, but uh, my question is, what are some unintentional causes of data exposure that might not that we might not think of right away? Jimmy or Wes, you guys can answer this. Jimmy, you go first. Uh, well, I said it earlier, the clean, clean desk, people leaving information, documents out on the desk, password out on the desk, anything like that. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, accidentally leaving access to uh, uh, employee access after someone leaves or contractor access after someone leaves. There's people who have, um, you know, they might have shared a file server or even like a a Google Drive folder or something like that with someone and not realize, kept adding to it, kept adding to it. And all of a sudden, you know, this other company has access to it. So it, it's people doing things unconsciously is, you know, the most common examples. And, and I hear you're right, Jimmy. And I, I love to sort of like, when I, when I convey this to end users, I like to smile and joke about it a little bit and like, let them know, Hey, it's going to happen guys. Like it happens to every organization, bunch right. of humans around humans make mistakes. So what we want to do is make sure that you understand when it happens, that you let us know about it. And then we, we can, we can work through that and make sure it's not as big of an issue. And they're like, oh, okay. That way I'm not like, you better not let this happen because then I'm going to keep it quiet. I remember my own dad one time, he lost a laptop for an old job and he's, and he knew he lost it. He, he couldn't remember where he lost it. It was somewhere in his travels. And I'm like, dad, what'd you do about it? I'm a security guy. He's like a biologist. He's like, oh, I didn't tell anybody. I'm like, why? <laughs> he's like, because they would have written me up because they would have yelled at me and they'd have been super angry and probably made me go pay for it. So he's like, it's just easier for me to be like, oh yeah, I got it at home. And like, you know, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I'm like, oh my goodness, what a horrible security culture that's been set at that organization to where he is afraid to report it for all the wrong reasons. Let's not let that happen. And so it could even be something as simple as, you know, an employee emails a PDF to what they thought was Sally Sue, but it was actually Sally Jane. Oops, it was the wrong company. They just typed in Sally. Those things happen. 
And so 14.5 is about a couple things, training our users to know, oops, this thing happened. I'm going to let them know. And two, to, to really build in what are your processes when those things happen. So I'd ask you listening today, if someone, if one of your clients lost a laptop, what would you do? If they accidentally emailed something with real important confidential data to somebody, what would you do? If you haven't thought through those things yet, now's your time to sit down and say, well, what would we do? Let's build some procedures out because that's really what this is about in 14.5. Yeah, absolutely. Reminder too, if you have any questions, anyone in this chat, put them in now before we run out of time because we would love to discuss them. That is where you'll get the most values if we can answer uh, any specific questions you might have. Um, yeah. Another, another point on unintentional data exposure is... Uh, state notification laws. So you kind of mentioned earlier, Wes, like, well, the government, like federal government might come out with some kind of regulation that'll have to do with notifications, but individual states, I know personally from Delaware, um, which is where I am, have their own notification laws. So teaching your employee, like, it'd be a huge problem if you have that adversarial mindset, employee leaks some data unintentionally, and then the state finds out or anyone else finds out. And then like you're blindsided as the security team. You're like, what are you talking about? Nobody, you, you look back in your notes, like nobody's reported anything. We haven't leaked anything. And then they show up with the, they point to uh, the information that they got access to somehow. And they're like, well, all right, now this is a really big problem. And then that employee is even further on the hot seat that they wanted to avoid in the first place. Uh, it's an interesting dichotomy. Yep. And we, we've got to be prepared for that, right? Like Jimmy knows this being from New York, New York and California are two leading states in like privacy and privacy laws. And then I don't think we have anyone on the webinar today from overseas, but you look at GDPR and the EU, um, very significant sweeping changes on how we define uh, personal information. No longer is it just social security numbers and credit cards, it's names, it's addresses, it's phone numbers, it's emails, it's IP addresses. Isn't this crazy? And so bad guys, of course, take advantage of this and say, in this new era, when they have access to your networks and they say, hey, if you don't pay the ransom and you recover from a backup, I'm still going to leak all your data unless you right. pay. We call this like that double extortion tactic. And so they take advantage of the need for privacy regulations in place. And they actually exploit that to make you pay. And so these are things we have to, we have to care about. That's right. Absolutely. So Jimmy, 14.6 is training, training employees to, to recognize cybersecurity incidents. All of us could probably uh, figure out what a, like a, an easily identifiable incident looks like, but what are, what's an incident that a strange one, or what are some incidents that you might not think employees should be aware of so that they can properly report them? Well, first of all, on reporting, um, the like the phishing emails are always a fun one. Uh, reviewing that with the organization, showing improvement over time. If you are sending out your phishing emails once a quarter and it's just like the same failure rate the entire time, nobody ever talks about it, um, you're not really doing anything for your organization. Again, that's just that compliance versus security thing. Um, but if you can make it a bit of a game out of it, people get excited to report things, make the process for reporting suspicious emails um, very easy. Um, I, I think that can go a long way. But specifically on uh, what I've seen that's like unique, I mean, most of it is, is email. Um, I have seen um, one MSP that we work with, they, uh, a, a hacking group actually made a fake version of their website. So they were dot like com and they took like dot CC and copied their website. And then um, somehow they got a hold of their client list and were actually calling the client list and pretending to be the MSP. Um, and it was like the, like the, the MSP couldn't stop it. They had to train all of their uh, clients how to recognize that this was happening. We actually went in and helped them. We have like a a verification tool where they can verify who the caller is on the other end. They can send like a push notification or a text. So that was able to solve it. Um, but like th these things are happening. It's not just like phishing emails coming through. There's uh, domain impersonations of websites. There's uh, typos of websites. Yeah. There's people posing as, um, you know, actual employees walking into the building, building, um, calling in, you know, social engineering attacks. Um, and just like, as Wes said, the best thing you can do is create a culture where it, people are encouraged to report things. 
see something, say something is what, you know, they say in New York, um, they say it in London too, I think, um, on the underground. They say it at the and, airport. Um, yeah, they say it everywhere. And, and there's a reason. And we should have that same culture here in our security programs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, an interesting thing that I always point out on any webinar that I do is the IRS won't call you. And then somebody somewhere in the crowd, it's like, well, that can't mean all the time, right? And I'm like, if you call, if, if somebody calls you and says, hey, I'm with the IRS, it's like 100%. It's not the IRS. If you don't believe me, go to their website, irs.gov, and look for a phone number on their website. And if you find one, call it and ask them if there's a problem. And then I get a lot of people that complain about their banks, quote unquote. I don't know if you have ever had to deal with somebody impersonating your bank, Wes, but they'll say, hey, there's an issue with your account and we need your password in order to log in and verify something's not happening. Uh, and I was shocked when I started saying, I was like, hey, these are very common scams that everyone's like, oh my goodness, like that happens to me and my family members every week. It's like, we get a call and I'm like, here's what you do. Go to their website. In this case, you know, you, Jimmy, you mentioned like the domain impersonation. That's a whole nother level. But I said, go to the actual website of your bank or go to the application on your phone. Look for a, a support number to call. And if, it, if you're really worried that your account's compromised, if you're really worried that that was not a scam, it's like the two minutes it takes you to verify that you're talking to the right person is not going to make a difference. Like it'll still be okay. Couple, a couple of things I wanted to say on this one um, that, that are good. So it's train workforce members to be able to recognize a potential incident. So keep in mind where CIS nor anyone is expecting clients to be a hundred percent right. You're just asking them to say a potential thing. So you have to be willing as a security person or as an MSP today, you have to be willing to, to entertain some amount and maybe a fair amount of false positives that come with it. And I would just encourage you that it's better to deal with false positives than false negatives, right? It's better to say, yep, that ended up not being an issue, but we're glad we checked it out versus, oops, we had no idea until it was too late. That's the first thing. And then the other, the other piece is it says, and to be able to report such an incident. So I would ask you today, how do, how do you have the ability for your clients to report something? Just think about that. Maybe it's security at your domain.com. Maybe it's a, a phone line, but there needs to be a process that you have in place in some form or fashion that gives them a method to be able to report these things and gives them the capability, make sure that they're aware of it, right? Because if something really hits the fan and your organization just has no ability to have that standardized, it can turn into a real mess. You know, oh, I talked to, you know, Bob over there, who's a system administrator, he said he'd handle it and he forgot, right? Like that's, yeah, we, we want to avoid those things. Yeah. Recognize is the first part. Report is the second part. And for all the attendees here, that's why it's super important to make sure you're going out of your way to instill a non-adversarial security program. Because even if it has nothing to do with the training or the phishing simulations or the actual awareness training topics you're doing, the, the adversarial-ness I can't think of the word off the top of my head of your program will filter into all of these other areas and might lead to additional problems that are unforeseen as of now. So 14.7 is training workforce to identify and report if their enterprise assets are missing updates. I think all of us kind of have an initial thought as to why this would be important, right? But I'll give you an analogy real quick before I hand it off to one of you two. Is I always say that there are two types of software that you need you worry about worried about as an individual. There's your hard, there's like your operating system, and then there's a software that lives on top of it, the applications. If you have a vulnerability in your operating system, that's like if your house had a huge crack in its foundation. It's like wow. It's like everything could be put at risk here. This is a complete issue. Whereas if you have uh, out of date applications like Zoom that we're using or Google Chrome or Microsoft Word, or it, I don't know if that's something you could update like that. That'd probably get operating system updates. But if you have a, a vulnerability in the software that you have installed on your computer, then that's like if you left a window open or a door unlocked or something like that. Um, but what, sh what should we expect? My question is, what should we expect from end users in reality here? It's like, they're not going to know, oh, our RMM's out, out of date. It's like, what should they be be held accountable to? What should they actually report to us as a security team? Any of you can answer. Jimmy. I'll, I'll, I'll dive in first. And then um, uh, Jimmy, I'm curious what you think too. So one thing that we're really trying to accomplish here is the reality is that we might have good automated patching, but it's never perfect. It just isn't. And the larger your organization gets, or as an MSP, the more organizations you support, the more difficult this becomes. 
going, we, we haven't really talked about all the other controls. We're just focused on control 14, but way back to the genesis of CIS is control one, which is your inventory of your hardware assets. And then control two is your inventory of your software assets. And the reason both of those are important is because we can't secure what we don't know about. And sometimes it happens that you have some computer running somewhere that's running some version of whatever, and you just popped it. Maybe it's, it's not used often. And they open up the internet and it's using, you know, Chrome version, something old, right? We, these are things we have to know about. And so the only ways that we're going to know about it is when our users who have eyes on the system are the ones that see it. And so I think encouraging, as you said, Connor, like a non-adversarial approach to all this, encouraging them to sort of be like, hey, I saw this thing that said it needed to be updated and it doesn't look like it's been updated. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. We're going to get right on it. That's the result. That's how you take action on it because that's how you reduce this surface area risk of vulnerable things because I wish we were always 100% seeing and patching everything, but we won't be. And so let's leverage our end users who have eyeballs on the systems to notify us when we have gaps in coverage. Yeah, everything Wes said, and I'll just call out one more piece of this. At Scout, we saw this. I know you saw it at Perch too. Uh, a very, very large percentage of successful attacks were due to unpatched and out-of-date software, known vulnerabilities, known CVEs, years after they've been out there, and they will continue to. So mean time to patch uh, is a security metric that is very telling of the security um, uh, of an organization, like how mature they are. It is very, very important to patch software and uh, the more buy-in you can get with that, with your end users, the, the more secure your organization is going to be because it is how hackers are getting in. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would almost add that another part here, 14.7 could also be, uh, it's not necessarily patching, but rotating passwords, right? If you don't, now individuals have a hard time remembering four digits in a row. So you would need some kind of password manager for this, but in my mind, it also makes sense to train your workforce to recognize or wholly take it out of their hands when their authentication is stale or when they've, there should be some kind of gut reaction in my mind when that happens, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense to me. We can help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then 14.8, the dangers of connecting to and transmitting over insecure networks. Uh, I'd like, I'd like your, your guys' opinion on two parts of this. One, identify insecure networks because I have actually had people say no 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 at Panera they made me put in a password it's secure and I'm like oh no it's like we we have a lot of work to do here uh, so that's the first thing and the second thing is if somebody does like work from home is here to stay whether or not business owners would like to admit like, it's here in some capacity so there's all of these additional risks with potentially insecure networks at homes so first is what are all the types of insecure networks that people might have to work from in some cases? Uh, and then how can we make them more secure? Where can we start doing that? Jimmy, you can go. First. Can I have a hot take on or this one? I got a hot take on this one. Go ahead. If there's one that we've talked about that maybe like 10 years ago, when we covered this, I've been like, this is so important. Fortunately, Today, good design, like good network design mm -hmm. makes this one of the lesser important ones. And I know that might be a hot take, but let me kind of explain. I'm not saying it's not important. And I'm not saying we shouldn't train our users on this. We should, right? right? But it's really difficult because there's this thing called a Wi-Fi pineapple is an example of this. I can go put a Wi-Fi pineapple like anywhere I want physically, like at a conference you're at, Connor. And what it will do oh, is yeah. it listens for beacons of your machine saying, I'm trying to connect out to my home network, which is Connor's Wi-Fi or whatever. And then the Wi-Fi pineapple goes, oh, that's me. Here you go. And then you're computer just connects to it, right? Like it, it's difficult to stop that stuff. And so I sure I can tell my employees all the time, go look for like a Wi-Fi network that you're connected to that doesn't seem legitimate, man, that's hard for them to do, right? right. Like we've really been talking about see something, say something. It's hard. It's hard for them to have this checklist of a million things to do. And that's a hard one. And so I think it's valuable for sure to tell them, Hey, you know, when you have VPN, make sure you use it, you know, yeah. make sure you use things like HTTPS when it exists. Mm -hmm. Right. But like we have so many things that force this into good hygiene, like forcing it into HTTPS or even things like, and I don't want to get too technical right now, but like even things like how we connect into cloud services, 
doesn't even always require like going into a VPN behind a firewall anymore these days, right? So we're, we're now able to architect really good identity management systems that negate this worry as much. So it is important for sure. But I do think what's really important is going beyond what this control is about and really making sure we're architecting good solutions that 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 let us have our employees have access to their data, but in an in a in a in a way that is done differently. And a lot of this comes down to this term called zero trust, and we won't break mm-hmm. into that too much. But you can Google that later and, and what zero trust looks like. But that's the whole goal of all of this, and, and it's so important today in a post pandemic environment where people do work from home, like I am right now. So, Jimmy, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, we used to. Uh have the firewall or the network um, being the firewall. And now the endpoint is the firewall. The, you know, that's the last thing that we need to secure, especially with work from home. Couldn't agree with more with everything that you said. Uh, if you're using VPNs, you have to train people on it. Most new organizations and new SaaS software aren't even using VPNs. And that's okay because the encryption at the, um, the uh, browser level is, is secure. So you, you really, you know, we've Chrome has rolled in serious updates recently where they're marking anything with SSL problems as insecure. You need to train people on that, but that has done a lot of the work for you. If you're using Chrome or Firefox. Now, when you have people on internet Explorer or old browsers or things, you can run into these problems more uh, and you should be training people. If it says this is an insecure connection, then they shouldn't connect to it. They shouldn't put in their information because it's probably a phishing website. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Wi-Fi pineapple's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> my my cousin actually used to fly, a, he put one on his drone, uh, flew it around his neighborhood and would see how many different Wi-Fi networks he could connect to. Uh, and it was shocking. And awesome. It was shocking how many people don't even have passwords on their own Wi-Fi, but we can get into that some other time. Uh, so the last point here, uh, we only have a few minutes left, folks. So if you have a question, on anything we've talked about today, now is the time or forever hold your peace. Uh, but 14.9, conduct role-specific security awareness and skills training. So Wes, we talked about this a little bit before the webinar started. This is the only sub-control that is IG2. What does that mean and why might it be IG2? What's the difference? So, yeah, IG2 means you need to do all the others before this one. Don't rush. Don't put the cart ahead of the horse. If you try to like, con- for example, this one is conduct role-specific training. So should I conduct role-specific training before I even have a program in place? Of course not, right? So it's, it's cart and horse, right? So after you have the horse running and it's doing the right things, then you can consider this one. And it's vi- this one's a big one, right? So like, for example, at the bank, yet again, here I go, we had specific training for our wire operators because they're the ones that can actually move hundreds, if not millions of dollars. In fact, we move millions and millions and millions of dollars every single day. And so I would often like sort of like mother hen them and come around like, hey, you guys know how important you are to the bank, right? And they're like, yes. And we'd be like, you know how important it is like to, to make sure that we're doing this the right way because we could lose a lot of money. And they're like, yes. And we would walk through specific things on how they operated, what machines they, they would use, how their checks and processes and approvals would go to eliminate collusion, all these, it's a big deal for them. Do you think I would like go through hours and hours of that kind of stuff with a teller? No. Teller doesn't need to know all of that. And I don't want to bog them down with it, right? Or outside of a bank, you know, like think about uh, just a, uh, like a manufacturing company that produces widgets. Well, probably the bookkeeper requires some specific training because if the bookkeeper is the one that's paying things out and receiving invoices, probably important that he or she understands things like how phishing attacks that look like invoice scams work and how business email compromise works. I may not worry about some of that for like the line employees that are keeping the factory controls going, right? That's their job. And so this is where role specific training become really, really valuable. It's where you can really distinguish yourself as a security solutions provider because you're going beyond just I'm putting widgets in place and keeping things safe. I'm actually providing training for you to make sure that your company stays healthy, stays operational, continues to generate revenue, reduces risk. You become this advisor in the organization when you start doing these kinds of things, which really makes them say, man, I'm so glad I have my IT person like this to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And the when I specifically talking about something like this with other MSPs, like, okay, we need to instill this kind of program in our clients and they're asking us to make, I've gotten this exact request, role-based training. My first question comes down to access and data. It's like, okay, it's like if you send me a list of people that have just their titles, it's like that means absolutely nothing. 
I don't know what kind of access those people have. I don't know what kind of data they're potentially handling, which is in my mind, the most important piece to doing the role specific training is like the people need to be exposed. Like you mentioned, you're not going to do certain things with a teller. It's like, well, why? It's like, well, they're not at risk of, you know, wiring hundreds of millions of dollars the wrong way. Whereas this other group of people are. Uh, so sometimes, sometimes I see people fall short or like, I see the light bulb, light bulb click after the fact. It's like, maybe you only need to create three roles that you train people on because you only have three different segments of access. And then we, you know, whole nother conversation about how to distribute access properly to the people that need it when they need it. But that's for a different day. Jimmy, do you have any thoughts on this before we close out? I mean, it's just another common sense thing. Like the people wiring money uh, should have a little more specific training than the people who are, you know, uh, managing deliveries and packages. Yeah, absolutely. Anything you want to say before we wrap up, Wes? Hopefully we've been an encouragement for you. If you feel overwhelmed by this, don't. Like, just go back to, to control 14.1 and start there and ignore yeah. the rest. They don't exist. And then when you get it done and you're happy with it, it's never going to be perfect. You can always iterate and improve. Then go to 14.2 then 14, three, see what I mean? And it's also okay if you're like, well, we did 14, one, two, and three, we skipped four, we're new five and six, but there's some other controls that we like, that's okay too. Like it is okay for you to sort of checklist off these on the ones that are most bang for your buck, the ones you know you can do, but be encouraged by this. Like we don't want to be the intimidating, oh no, if you don't do all this, you're going to get breached and you're a horrible person. No, there's a lot of work that goes into it, but you can do this and focus on the ones that you know you've got controls around and you can work on. And I promise you'll see progress and I promise you'll see results. And I promise you'll see better revenue, reduced risk, fewer employee or uh, like uh, company churn, all this kind of stuff. So I just want to end with that encouraging note that um, this is immensely yeah. valuable and you can do it. Any last words of encouragement, Jimmy? Security is an ongoing process. It's not a single product that can solve all your needs. Pick a destination, pick a framework like CIS and start following it. Absolutely. The best, uh, the best thing to do is just get started, right? That yeah. if you're doing nothing. So everyone, thank you for joining today. It was, we were joined by the great Wes Spencer and the great Jimmy Hatzel. Uh, as I said at the beginning, the recording will be available. So when we're done, doctoring it up and making sure everyone's contact information ends up getting attached to it. I'll send it out to all of you who have joined so you can get to look at this. We would really appreciate it. If you shared this anywhere, let us know. Oh yeah. Check out Wes's podcast right there on the CIS. Um, but thank you for joining and we'll be doing these every month. So uh, we'll bring on other experts like Wes and Jimmy to talk about things that relate to security. It doesn't have to be a black box that nobody gets to understand what's going on. It's hard to start. And there's all these barriers to entry. Like Wes said, start with one step, then move to two, then move to three and uh, you'll be good. So everyone, thanks for joining. Sorry, we ran. Well, we ran exactly to one hour. So appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, thanks everyone. You.